Okay, looks like we have everybody here. We're going to start the uh, Transportation Advisory Board meeting for Monday, June 10th. Um, call to order. We just did that. Let's do roll call. Chair Lehner. Here. Board Member Bennett. Here. Board Member Wicklin. Here. Vice Chair Mickey Burroughs. Here. Board Member McInerney. Here. Board Member Kim. Here. Great, thank you. Um, and before we do the uh, number three approving minutes of preceding um, meetings, I wanted to just take a quick uh, aside here and recognize Phil for his 24 years with the city of Longmont. We do appreciate your dedication to all things transportation in the city. Okay, uh, we'll go to the approving of minutes of preceding meetings. Do we have any um, comments or corrections to the minutes from May 2024? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Can we get a motion to approve? I will motion to approve the May 2024 minutes. Seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And now we'll move to communications from staff. Phil, take it away. Great. Well, thank you so much for the recognition of being here that long. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> um, there's been some, there's some folks down the table who have been here longer, so, and behind the table. So there are some people who have been here longer than I, so I appreciate them, of course, teaching me everything I know. Um, we just want to let you know that we've gone through the nominating process with our uh, nominating committee of three folks, two on the board and one staff member. Um, and so we do have three applicants that we're going to share with City Council. It's been recommended that I not share those names quite yet until they're made public to City Council. So you'll find out um, with everyone, I think, in the next um, month or so, as we hopefully in June at the one of the next meetings, you'll find out pretty quickly so that we can uh, have a good meeting on uh, in July because one of the things that we'd like to do is uh, uh, that July business meeting and just a reminder that we're moving that to July 15th. So just wanna give you some heads up there. Also wanted to let you know that a microtransit provider has been, one vendor has been selected as far as moving to the next phase of the process. So again, I can't say who it is at this point, but we're hof we'll hopefully have more information at your next month's meeting. But I did wanna let you know that we are moving forward. We hope to get a microtransit vendor on board and ready to go I'm going to say by Labor Day, and that might be a little optimistic, but I'm going to say Labor Day. Uh, lastly, we had a downtown projects open house last, or a couple, it was last Thursday, Thursday, a couple of Thursdays ago, yeah. And so um, it was very interesting with all the folks. We had uh, the um, Free Taco Bar, which was, got a lot of folks to show up, so there was a, uh, it was well attended. It was really about downtown projects, and it wasn't. There was some transportation element to that, but a lot of it was the hotel and different things like that. So, um, well attended, and uh, Public Works was really the lead on that. So it was very good, very good event. Well attended, and I think a lot of information was moved back and forth at that meeting. So we appreciated that. And with that, um, I think that's all we have. Oh. See, this is Jim. Jim Jim might want to state this. No, you had. Okay. Well, we uh, we just want to make sure you all know that it's Bike to Work Day on June 26th. And so Ben's sitting behind me, and he really kind of runs that show, and Jim uh, provides the budget for that. So uh, it's been uh, it's a really good, really good event and uh, well attended. So if you can make it on June 26th early in the morning, we'll have free pancakes and sausage for you. So ride by, and we'll... We'll get to something, and I think there's a number of other stations in town too. So uh, there's one at South Sherman Street as well, typically for the Public Works facility down there. For, so those are the two city ones, city sponsored ones, and then there's other sponsors that take over from there. So I think with that, that might be it for 
items from staff? Yes, sir. Phil, what are the uh, breakfast hours for bike to work day? What are we saying, Ben, nine or seven to nine? Seven to nine. Seven to nine. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Please stop by. We're right there on the west patio of the library. Great. Thank you. Sounds like it'll be a fun event. Uh, let's move on to um, public comments. We have uh, Dan Wolford here. Good evening. How is everyone tonight? Before I get rolling, um, Dan Wolford, 1815 Third Avenue. I'd like to congratulate Phil for 24 years. I'd, I'd ask him how his eyesight is. My wife's been his eye doctor for uh, a few years, maybe. Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. She recently retired. So I'm here um, representing um, a, a group of folks, uh, Stan with our St. Vrain, and I'm here tonight to make an appeal to the Transportation Advisory Board. I'd love to see um, you folks provide a city council recommendation uh, related to the city's permanent um, open space sales tax extension. Um, this is kind of a, a weird process. A lot of times, much of the ballot issues in those come from council. We're going the other route from a citizen's perspective, um, and we've been working on this process for a little over a year. Um, the bond issue, if it gets placed on the ballot, will not require any additional sales tax, so that's a, a good thing. Very similar to the transportation tax that was approved to be permanent, what, maybe 10 years ago? Um, you know, a significant process to go through that process. Um, by making it a permanent sales tax, the open space uh, program uh, will continue to uh, further purchase open space lands and water rights to support those lands. It'll help maintain the existing open space and nature areas that the city has. Um, it also allows us to do long range planning and certainly from that perspective of knowing that you've got a revenue stream allows you to do that as well as provide further um, capital development that, that goes on. Two of the key issues of the criteria associated with uh, the open space program, besides wildlife habitat preservation and sustainable agriculture, is the linkage of trails to public uh, areas through our open space and our, and our parks, as well as implementing greenway and open space policies and strategies what that means you know from a transportation perspective is supporting um, the goals and strategies of the cities for uh, uh, multimodal transportation uh, by means of public access uh, greenways trails um, for passive recreation opportunities and typically um, non-motorized um, as i was looking through your agenda tonight um, the astute staff, of which I've worked with many of them, um, have for you an, an update of the 2024 capital projects. I just wanted to relate to you the relationship that the open space program has with the transportation uh, program. Um, a variety of uh, trail projects in, in particular, uh, for instance, the RSVP project. I'm certain you're all very familiar with that. Much of that work took place on city open space, as well as having monetary contributions for the success of what's been done through the open space sales tax. Is that my three minute? Wow, that was quick. All right, thanks. The other one is the couple other ones at St. Frank Greenway, where there's been um, open space lands donated for that purpose, as well as monetary contributions. Uh, a variety of other trails. Um, I know there was at least three and a half million dollars worth of open space spent on the success and the, I think we're on phase three of the Spring Gulch, uh, that, that connection. Uh, the widening of Weld County Road 26, funding associated with the open space program. Dry Creek Community Park um, and, and trail connections through those areas. 
you know, being involved in many of the planning efforts that th this transportation work group has gone through. The open space program w was the lead um, on the uh, Colorado Front Range Trail pr project, if you're familiar with the trail from Wyoming to New Mexico. And certainly we participated with Phil and a, gr and a group as we l looked through in Envision at Longmont. As you can see, there is that long history of work between the open space program and the, success, the successes of the transportation group. We're not done yet. We got a, a wide variety of future trail projects that we're, we're gonna be working together. Um, that includes the St. Fran Greenway going east to St. Fran State Park, to the west to Lyons and Pella Crossing. Um, I don't know how familiar they are with the County Road 26 project, working with Weld County um, through uh, city open space from Union Reservoir out to St. Frank State Park. That's d just coming down the line, as well as connections from Lake McIntosh to the Greenway. And what we would love to see is the Dry Creek Trail connection under 75th to the AHI and Lagerman property. So a long history of working together. How we got to this process, uh, the public process for looking for the um, extension of the open space uh, program has been uh, a process that's run us nearly a, a year in that process. In that time, we've collected over a thousand names on, on an appeal throughout the community at special events like Rhythm on the River, uh, Pride Fest, um, let me say Art Walk, Earth Earth Day celebrations, as well as the most recent water festival. So a lot of public process. We're also- We'll, to, to, we'll give you 10 more seconds, okay? You got it. Yep. We got tonight, um, on the other side of town, uh, the Parks Board is listening to this and we're doing the same thing. So, you know, just to wrap up, you know, there's a great relationship here and that would continue if the open space sales tax were to be continued. And we want to see that, you know, permanently. So what I'm asking for tonight is a request from TAB to consider an, an action item for next month to provide a letter of recommendation to city council to support this open space sales tax extension. Again, we know that there's quite a bit to, to be done from a trails perspective and a transportation perspective with the passage of that I think we can find that and come to a fruition of many of these goals. Happy to address any questions or concerns. I tossed a brochure on your desk. If there's any questions, don't hesitate to holler or shout. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you, and I guess we'll move on to uh, information items, the 2024 CIP update. And I'll just introduce Alton Jenkins from our crew, and he'll take it from there and tell you who he is and the folks with him. Thanks. Good evening, uh, Chair Laner, TAB members, Council Liaison uh, Yarbrough. My name is Alden Jenkins. I'm a senior civil engineer within Public Works. Joined tonight on my left by Alan Brining and Phil Greenwald on my right. And tonight we'll be providing an update on our 2024 capital improvement program as it relates to projects that are under some level of current design or construction. Uh, one quick clarification about this presentation uh, is that it is different than a presentation that we typically provide in August. Uh, that August presentation uh, is focused on our future forward-looking projects or our proposed five-year CIP budget this is a uh, project uh, the presentation tonight is focused just on our current projects in 2024 so as we go through our presentation uh, i'm sure you're going to have questions as we go through these projects uh, feel free to jump in uh, as we go as we conclude a specific project uh, showcase if you have a question feel free to jump in and we'll address it at that time and then we can address further questions later on if need be as well so uh, that being said, we'll jump straight into our active construction projects. The first project we're looking at is our asphalt pavement management program. This is an asset management project that focuses on our asphalt pavements throughout the city uh, with a focus uh, that uh, is 
is accomplished with multiple different scopes of work, such as asphalt rehabilitation, sometimes asphalt reconstruction, concrete repairs in the form of damaged sidewalk, curb, and gutter, and then also upgrades to deficient curb ramps to make them more accessible for pedestrian users. It also includes components of preventative maintenance in the form of chip seal and crack seal. Uh, while this program does have a focus on, uh, on asphalt management, we do take the opportunity when it presents itself to make adjustments and changes to the facilities on that corridor itself. So for example, the photo you see on the screen uh, is actually a, a somewhat of a dated photo from Sunset Street some years ago in need of rehabilitation. We took that opportunity to provide an update to the, not only the pavement surface, but also adjustments to the travel lanes by adding bike lanes. Uh, there are some instances of that happening with the, this year's program, notably Airport Road south of 17th Avenue is seeing some minor adjustment to the striping to provide better bike facilities, as well as South Fordham Street south of, uh, I believe it's Clover Basin Drive, is seeing some level of road diet uh, also to improve the bike facilities on that corridor. The next project uh, you may or may not have heard of is the Kaufman Street Mobility Improvements Project. Uh, this is a project along Kaufman Street from 1st Avenue to 9th Avenue. Uh, it does also have a component of asset management to it as the asphalt pavement is in uh, fairly severe distress and in need of replacement. But at its core, this project is a multimodal transportation project. Uh, significant improvements uh, will be focused on pedestrian sidewalk upgrades, uh, improvements to the existing intersections in addition to mid crosswalks as well. Transit improvements include uh, the addition of dedicated bus lanes in some areas as well as bus stops, and then also bike lanes both northbound and southbound uh, to actually to clarify separated bike lanes, so fully separate from the street uh, along the entire length of the project. One key feature of this project includes the installation of a protected intersection at both 4th Avenue and Longs Peak Avenue. One of the benefits, uh, many benefits of a protected intersection, which would be the first of its kind in Longmont, is that it makes the uh, experience of pedestrian and bike users using that intersection to have a much more safe and comfortable experience. So I don't have any great photos of that project under construction. Up to this point, there's just been pre-construction activities in the form of utility relocations. Uh, but the main project is going to be starting actually two weeks from today uh, with an expected duration of two years. So that'd be June 24th is our planned start date for that project. Uh, our next project here is the Spring Gulch Number no. 2 Improvements Project. Uh, this $4.5 million project is located from, a uh, uh, trail project is from Weld County Road 26 down to the Sandstone uh, Ranch Underpass at Colorado 119. Uh, this is the third and final phase of this trail project that has been, uh, the, tr the third phase has been under construction since, since September 2023. As a result, uh, most of the trail segments of this phase are actually already complete. Uh, at this point, we have a few areas that need to be filled in, but our current focus right now is to complete the pedestrian or the trail underpass that goes underneath the Great Western Railway tracks. Uh, that's been in, under construction for some time now. There's quite a bit to go that goes into that. So uh, this is the, the key component to get the whole thing completed at this point. Right now, we're tracking this project for a completion in July of this year. So right around the corner, we're going to be looking at an opening day for this one. So I'm going to go ahead and pass this on to Alan for the next few projects. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Um, I'm going to speak to you. I'll start with the Boston Avenue Bridge replacement project, which is currently under construction. Um, I am managing that project. Uh, I'll run through a few of the highlights. Um, if you have any questions about this one, I feel I can maybe answer those. Um, the project is replacing the existing Boston Avenue Bridge, as you probably all know if you've driven by or ridden by or walked by or anything down there. Uh, we're constructing a new bridge that will be longer and wider both. 
So there will be additional widening to accommodate uh, about an eight foot pedestrian walk across the bridge on both sides. Uh, the last one, I don't know if you remember, was about a four foot wide walk that was a uh, little frightening to walk across if there were big trucks coming around. They smack you pretty easy with their mirrors. Uh, the new bridge will also have on street, five foot wide on street bike lanes. Uh, there will be one lane in each direction and a center turn lane uh, over the bridge. So the bridge is going to be quite a bit wider. Uh, it's about 110 feet or so longer than the existing bridge was. Well, it doesn't even exist anymore. We demolished the rest of it last month. The city entered into a contract with Zach Dirt in September of 2023. Uh, the project's contract time is, uh, originally is 18 months, which takes us to about March of 2025. Demolition of the first half of the bridge started in October and uh, with a very aggressive schedule and some beautiful weather for construction, uh, we put traffic onto the half of the new bridge that we've constructed in April. Um, we started demolition almost immediately after the entire old bridge is completely gone now. Uh, the new foundations, columns, pier caps, abutments are all complete on the new section. Uh, we cast the last girder. Well, actually, it will get cast tomorrow. So we'll probably have a girder set um, in July. So there'll be a two-night closure when you can come down and watch some very large cranes that we don't typically have in town very often, swinging uh, big girders into place on the second half of the structure. Um, there is a modular block retaining wall, pretty impressive one on the west side of the creek that is now complete. All of the excavation for the new channel, uh, we dropped the bottom of the channel about six to seven feet under the bridge. So we excavated down into bedrock about six or seven feet um, and are regrade, have regraded. And landscaping will start um, well, I would say probably in about a month. Right now, if you go down there, it's pretty flooded. The creek has come up rather substantially in the last week. So I don't know that we'll be doing landscape immediately until the creek, until the river of the creek goes back down and we can get back in there to work. Um, actually, the contractor is approximately seven months ahead of schedule and we could be done building the structure uh, in uh, October of this year. I hesitate saying that because then I just, uh, yeah, I, I just stepped right into it if I'm not done by October. But I, I have some personal um, interest in being done in October, Jim. So um, the next project um, is the Boston Avenue connection. Uh, this is one I'm very excited to see moving forward. Uh, we tried a few years ago um, and met with some resistance from the PUC. We have gone back to the PUC uh, with a better plan now. And um, this route, the Boston Street route, when this is complete, will be an important part of the connection for transportation because of the bus rapid transit We'll take access, come up from uh, 119 up and across and through into the new first and main transportation hub. Um, we submitted 30% design drawings to the PUC in June and we received conditional approval of the new at grade crossing uh, pending final plans. Final plans are scheduled to be submitted to the PUC in the end of July. We have an estimated cost on that one of about 4.1 million. And we're planning to start construction in the spring of 2025. Next one, the Ken Pratt Boulevard and Sunset Street improvements. Uh, this is a real interesting project. 
uh, from the engineering side of it anyway, there's an awful lot of um, shareholders who were involved and you have to work through an awful lot of departments. Um, there is the BNSF Railroad, uh, CDOT, um, Colorado PUC, again, the energy and uh, XL Energy has some lines and infrastructure that will be needing to be relocated and the Longmont Power and Communication, of course, has lines that will also be affected. Uh, this one, there is a, we received a grant uh, for about 1.2 million from CDOT for the project. Most recent cost estimates, about 3.9 million. Uh, the de design efforts at about a 90% complete. Um, construction is anticipated to begin uh, early in the spring of 2025. And the last one for me is uh, Dry Creek Greenway Connection. Oh, I neglected to mention, I'm sorry, that the uh, Ken Pratt Boulevard Sunset Street improvement includes creating a quiet zone at the BNSF with new gates, new locations for the gates, a new median, all of the things that go into creating a um, safe, quiet zone. It will really improve pedestrian and bicycle facilities, uh, make them much safer and ADA compliant. Um, now the last project, sorry about that, Alden, is the Dry Creek Greenway. Uh, this one is a connection from essentially the Hover Street underpass at the Village at Ute Creek, um, uh, Village at the Peaks, excuse me, uh, across Sunset Street and over to where they can connect into Price Road and Nelson Road, where then you're easily into the St. Vrain Greenway um, this is also a connection that will help facilitate um, the new Longmont Housing Authority development um, by offering optional transportation means for people to walk and get to downtown Longmont pretty easily. Uh, project is currently in design, has a budget of about $163,000. Construction is scheduled to start in spring of 2025 and the preliminary construction cost is about nine hundred and seventy three thousand dollars that's what i have anyway and with that pass it back or pass it back to phil by the way phil congratulations it's nice to have you on board yeah thanks <laughs> and i guess i'll see you in october huh there'll be a party or something no okay <laughs> So I'm going to tell you a little bit about TRP 121, which is also known as the Colorado 119 Hover Street Intersection Improvement Project. And this one's a little bit more amorphous. It doesn't have a lot to it right now um, as we're working with CDOT. But as you know, I think we've talked to you quite a bit about this project. It, it isn't included in the Colorado 119 Bus Rapid Transit and the Safety, Mobility, and Bikeway Project. So there's a lot going on in that corridor. And this is kind of the very... I won't say the very end of the corridor because it does extend, as, as, as Alan mentioned, it does extend up over to Boston and then Boston over. And we all consider that part of the 119 corridor. Once it gets to first and Maine, then a couple corridors kind of come together there. But this one really has uh, some intersection design uh, issues. I think we showed you some of those uh, a while ago where we wanted to do an underpass. That was what the grant, the raise grant was uh, really meant to focus on was how do you get the boulder bound traffic underneath hover and uh, and eliminate one of the turn movement pieces there or one of the conflicts many of the a few of the conflicts actually and so uh, we've been working with the Colorado Department of Transportation Tom and I um, have been <laughs> in a, a number of meetings with them and we kind of laugh because it's been tough tough going because everybody's under budget constraints so the first thing we looked at was utilities, or they looked at was utilities, and found it very difficult to do an underpass in that location because of all the utilities. And it would take a lot of movement to make that work. So we've been working with CDOT. Uh, we're pretty, 
I think, excited to move forward with the idea of an overpass instead. So it's basically the same thing, but we're just going to lift it up over instead of under. So the, the issue there was the bicycle and pedestrian piece. So we're working with CDOT to make sure we get kind of a separate bicycle pedestrian underpass, probably, most likely, under the north leg of that intersection. So the overpass will kind of do its thing with cars, and then the underpass will do what we need for bicycles and pedestrians. Instead of, we're trying to combine it before, which we thought was pretty elegant and pretty uh, interesting, but it, it, it's too much. It costs too much. It blows the budget out of the water. So just to let you know, we're going to be working with them on that. That's a, a, a CMGC project, which means construction management, general contractor. Did I get that right? Pretty wow. Pretty close. I got pretty close. I'm just a planner, guys. So, um, But uh, that typically, what that technically means is basically they do about 30% design, and then they take that design and go out there and start constructing it and work it out in the field. So it's a little bit more efficient, and it knocks those costs down a little bit. And that construction is tentatively slated to start um, late 2025. So um, we're looking – it's actually – I think you'll see it starting – for the rest of the project, so we get a little excited about our section of the project, but the rest of the project is going to start here in the summer, this summer. So you'll see the other elements along the diagonal going in this summer, but ours will be kind of on the tail end because we don't have it quite to that level of design. And that's, I think that's it for that one. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. All right. Uh, I'll be taking the remainder of the projects include out and conclude out the presentation at this point. Uh, so our next project here that we're talking about under design is the first and main transit station. That's been mentioned, I think, a couple times already now this evening at this point. Uh, this is going to be located at the southwest corner of First Avenue and Main Street. And just a quick orientation here on the graphic. Uh, point of view here is at Kaufman Street and First Avenue looking to the southeast. So this is a, uh, it's a partnership project with RTD. Uh, regional transportation district and it does include some components of private development but the main piece of this project is a new transit and parking hub that will be supporting RTD's new bus rapid transit facilities once they start to come online in the next few years. Uh, as I mentioned this is a partnership project so that means that the uh, city is taking a, a primary role in a few tasks with this project one of which is to take on the design and construction of the extension of Kaufman Street from First Avenue down to Boston Avenue. So that graphic on the pre uh, previously there showed the constructed extension. This is a plan view and cross section of the proposed improvements. So this extension of Kaufman Street will def will include uh, pedestrian significant pedestrian improvements and bike improvements similar to those to the area to the north on the Kaufman Street Mobility Improvements Project. So that will be tying into that project to the north. It's all uh, separate projects, but it's all one enhanced effort for this general area. Design uh, is currently sitting at the 30% stage, and we are looking to go to construction for the extension of Kaufman Street in 2026. Next project here is the Railroad Quiet Zones project. Uh, this photo that we're providing here is uh, actually an example quiet zone of one that was constructed in Windsor, Colorado. Uh, this project is intended to implement quiet zone features at all existing crossings within the city of Longmont. And what that, what that really means in the end when something becomes a quiet zone is that uh, when a train approaches a, a, a crossing that's designated with those quiet zone facilities or features, they're not required to blow their horn. And just a, a clarification on that is that sometimes requires that multiple crossings adjacent to each other also have to have that same designation for you to really get any benefit from the quiet zone condition. What that really is geared towards to illustrate is that the area in downtown with all of those subsequent crossings along Atwood Street collectively for that to be a quiet zone, one of those to be a quiet zone, they all really have to have that same, the same features at that point. Uh, generally though, uh, there are numerous intersections that this project includes, of which they're divided into various packages. 
there and each package is, is at its own various stage of progress currently some of which are close to construction and some of which are in the earlier stages of design the first package which is uh, includes Longs Peak Avenue or sorry 3rd Avenue Longs Peak Avenue 9th Avenue and 17th Avenue uh, that project or that package was issued for bid earlier this year but we were unable to actually award that package uh, to a contractor within a budget that would work for the project. So what that means for us is that we're having to revisit our design with respect to some of the utility challenges that go alongside that first package, and our plan is to rebid that project again this summer. All right, uh, our last two projects are on County Line Road. Uh, First here being the County Line Road Shoulder Improvements Project from Zlayton Drive to the St. Vrain River. This is a joint project between the City of Longmont and Boulder County with Boulder County taking the lead role, uh, lead agency role for design and construction of the project with the city having a contribution of $475,000 for construction. Plain improvements include the addition of paved shoulders on both directions of, of uh, County Line Road from Zlayton Drive to the St. Vrain Greenway. Boulder County is expecting advertisement of the project for construction within the coming weeks, and the hope is to start construction soon thereafter and see completion of the improvements by the end of this year. Last project also on County Line Road, this time to the north, up from 17th Avenue up to Colorado 66. A uh, similar project in that it's going to be adding paved shoulders along the length of the project to support buffered bike lanes. Uh, it does also include a component of asset management as well to address the deteriorating asphalt along the stretch, as well as some focus to address the significant drainage issues that occur in some areas along the corridor as well. That project is at a 90% design completion, and we are hoping to go to construction on that one in early 2025. For our last slide, I uh, wanted to provide a list of all of our projects that we have at, under active design or construction in 2024. Not every project listed here we showcased. Uh, the ones that we did not showcase highlighted here now. Uh, there is additional information provided in the communication this evening that you should have, and we also have staff available on hand to answer questions about not only those, but any of the projects we've talked about up to this point. So that concludes our portion of the presentation. So thank you for your time, and we can address any questions you may have. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> do we want to start on the end? Do we have questions all the way around? Don't mean to put you on the spot. Yeah, um, I, I don't have any immediate questions. Okay. Yeah, yeah sure, I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> well, th thank you, Alden and Alan, for the presentation, and, and Phil, for, for your part. <laughs> um, I guess uh, general questions um concerning these cips is uh you know i'm assuming it just kind of follows our standard design like we have a street design standard and we just follow that do we ever deviate from that so my general feeling always and i've mentioned this uh in the setting before is you know bringing up how we use the road space so such as hearing a center turn lane on boston bridge i'm wondering what's what's the point of that could we also have a wider uh bike buffer type of thing um <clears throat> excuse me to uh, the purpose of the center turn lane over the bridge structure currently is there's a um, movement turning movement onto south francis which hmm. uh, on the west side of the structure comes in there and the pick up and drop off traffic uh, that goes to the school there locally uh, uses that center turn lane quite heavily as a turn bay. Um, there are also going east 
several of those businesses I've noticed have used the center turn lane both for turning traffic and for um, unloading I've actually seen several that park in the middle of the road and unload from the center of the road hmm. uh, could it be used or striped differently certainly if the rest of Boston is constructed to where it could support that um, our improvements are mostly um, paint on the surface will mm -hmm. have a wider that we could use as you say for other purposes if the rest of the roadway supported yeah. that it, right it, now it, it, yeah. it doesn't so yeah if the rest of boston was complete yes yeah yeah because is the west of the bridge is that still is that city or county right now because there's i um so i believe that the property on the north side of Boston has been annexed and is now okay. in the city okay. and the part of the south is the city so I believe the city now owns or okay. controls the right of way anyway from the bridge to sunset anyway all right thank you mm -hmm. um, let's see and then uh, on one question on the that we didn't talk about is the Hover Street reach uh, from what sunset to hover uh there will be another you know a uh, spillway for when the river overflows and then there'll be another bridge uh what south of the present bridge just north of boston uh is there a plan for also extending maybe multi-use pathway under there as well for all the future development that is happening to the west just curious I don't know if I'm quite suited to fully answer that to the okay. to a, a, a sufficient manner, so I might let Tom jump into that. Tom Street uh, with uh, Public Works and Engineering Department. Uh, good question. Uh, it is a consideration. We've just issued our R RFP for design services for that particular project. We have received some grant funding from the state and FEMA. So the design is moving forward. It'll probably take us two or three months to determine who the preferred design consultant is on that. But during the alternative evaluation process, that is one thing we'll be looking at. Not decided yet, but it's certainly a consideration. I, I think it's a great idea for any multimodal transportation to get under hover or a crossover somehow safely is probably the most pressing. Um, all right, then a uh, final question concerns the railroad crossings uh alden you mentioned that the you know the bid was or the the contractors were too high so now it goes back out to bid is there a way to you know save money because i see that every intersection is being used uh to have a quiet crossing uh do we need every intersection can we get rid of one and then maybe make the neighborhood safer, um, less through traffic. So I think to, I guess, address the latter part of your question and, and feel free to jump in, um, Jim, if I'm talking off base on some of these things, but uh, one component of, of the Quiet Zone project uh, and actually related to the Boston Avenue connection is to actually close two intersections. Okay. Uh, one of which is at the uh, Terry Street, just north of First Avenue. It's a small, short, relatively short, dead-end cul-de-sac uh, next to the grain silos that are there near the overpass. Okay. And then also Fifth Avenue uh, at Atwood Street is also going to be planned for for closure. So okay. uh, sort of serving a dual purpose there, and that that was a condition of being able to add the additional crossing at Boston Avenue, but at the same time, that's one less crossing that we actually have to be implementing as a quiet zone because uh, collectively at fifth avenue that would have to have been a quiet zone to yield the benefits at fourth avenue and long speak to the north uh, okay. sixth avenue as well okay uh, no I, I found it confusing just because fifth avenue is listed so may, maybe it's just the construction to close it i guess Could i be. believe that is th okay. that's the case yes okay yeah. um well, that, that's all I have for now, so thank you. Thank you for all the useful information. Um, that was illuminating to see what projects are under um, planning right now. 
Um, my first question is related to the Dry Creek connection to St. Vrain. And I was just wondering how that route is going to be actually mapped out. I don't have a picture in my mind of how that is going to look. I'm going to presume it's going to be kind of um, as an alternative to using Nelson. Is that correct? So, Phil, if you want, I can speak a little bit to it, but um, I don't know that I'll have all of the answers. The uh, connection, currently there's an underpass under Hover that comes into the mall area, the what used to be the mall. Um, there is some signage and a connection that gets you supposedly through that area. It isn't right, exactly. And so uh, what we'll do, I believe, is improve the signage, uh, possibly some additional concrete work to clarify where the trail goes to get from there to behind the, uh, I think it's Sam's Club, yeah, and there that there is no walk that continues from there over to Sunset. So our link will run along the top of the channel, as I understand it. Um, there's a dry creek channel that runs through that, and the ch bike path will be on the south side of the creek, oh. and it will run along the top over to Sunset. And then there will be an at-grade crossing yeah. at sunset uh, that can get over to where you can get to Nelson and Price. Okay, that, that's helpful because that yeah. is always a bone of contention for me because I yes. bike through there all the time and it's, there's no safe way for me to get anywhere near Nelson without riding on Nelson. So yes. I'm happy to hear that route will be a future project. Um, my other, I guess my a general comment is, um, it sounds like you're doing a lot of uh, road projects, but and you're including bike lanes and buffer bike lanes, but I didn't hear any mention of adding separated bike lanes in any of those projects. And I'm just wondering if that is, I know Kaufman Street is going to have a separated bike lane, but like more widely implemented for um, having them across the city. So I think generally the challenge with separated bike lanes, at least up to this point, has been what's the best way to maintain these separated bike lanes? Uh, you know, for now, at least with being, having lots of existing roads that have, been, that have been built out, the existing pavement section is really all that's available to us to be able to, to be putting in those bike lanes. So I think it's something that we're, we're definitely considering pushing forwards on, on projects that can allow it. But when we have the vertical barriers that are going to be designating as separated it has proven to be a maintenance challenge for the areas that we've pilot piloted it on in terms of snow removal and, and sweeping sweeping and keeping it actually clear so you are right boston or uh, kaufman street does have separated bike lanes as well as the extension uh from boston avenue to the south from first to to boston um so we are definitely considering that where we can, but uh, there's not all, every location can lend itself to be able to uh, implement that as much as we would prefer to, so. Okay, so I guess an extension, instead of, have you considered my, instead of just doing a buffer, making that natural permanent strip of concrete, for example, instead of it just being a, a stripe of buffering, making that a permanent concrete strip, does that make sense? Yeah, as in just like an actual curb, in, in between uh, the, absolutely the, the the conditions still exist though in that same uh the same scenario where it has to be wide enough to be able to get uh, a decent level of maintenance equipment in there so um whether it's a vertical barrier in terms of bollards or that permanent strip in between uh the challenge still exists there okay well, I would love to see more of them, so. I, it's certainly cer certainly something that we look at where we can implement it, for sure. Uh, it's just not all locations can seemingly do that. Of course. Yeah. But where you're adding the buffered ones is probably space, at least, essentially. Generally, our, our operations department has wanted to see uh, those that are running the snow removal and, and sweeping operations, uh, at least what they've tested is a minimum 10-foot distance uh, from any sort of physical barrier to the curb. Uh, and so in some areas, we have the buffered bike lanes to be able to support something like that. In some areas, we don't. Okay. 
Um, with the project with the uh, County Line Road, um, are, there, are you going to be adding a buffer bike lane on the south section of that, the Zlatan, or is that just going to be a shoulder? I believe it's just a shoulder. Am I right on that, Tom, or is that going to be a buffered bike lane as well? Yeah, both ends of our county line road project. Again, the southern segment is a project managed by Boulder County, but we do have buffered bike lanes on, on both ends. Okay, great. I guess that's all my questions. Thank you very much. Kind of go out of order. We'll just go right around. I just have a couple. Um, the first is on the Hover. I guess we would call it a flyover now. I, I suppose. I guess my concern is is the speed and the sight lines. So folks coming in from 119 into right now, if you notice, there's that rise in Hover, and people are still maintaining a fair high speed. I'm afraid with a high, with a flyover, it could almost exasperate that kind of situation so in terms of the design of that w w is there going to be any mitigation in terms of the speeds that come out or i should say in 119 as they come in because it's a very short uh amount of space right now where the speed goes i think from 65 down to 40 or 45 yeah it's a pretty quick transition right now um, both directions i guess i think what we're talking about is um to kind of handle some of that, I, I think we also think of the southbound hover traffic merging onto the diagonal piece. For the latest iterations that Tom and I saw, the, that traffic would have to go underneath the overpass and make a more traditional right turn, though it'll still have that skew, right? So it'll still be a little more prevalent there, but it'll, it'll have to be a little bit more traditional of a right turn where it actually connects to the roadway and goes and merges from the left, I believe. So um, there's some things that are going to change with that. CDOT's doing everything they can to talk about speeds and mitigating those speeds. So at this point, we're waiting till we see a design uh, more that's further along than I would say this is con conceptual at this point. So as soon as we get to that next level of design, we can certainly make sure that that, I mean, that's a issue for all of us. So I, we'll certainly carry that forward. So appreciate that comment. Yeah, um, and, and then the other thing would be on, I know that you had mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that you do make some, <clears throat> um, I won't call it design changes, but some either accommodations or changes on some of the pavement projects. And I know I've stated this before, but on Clover Basin, for example, by the Save Rain School you know, um, District Office, we're going to have an accident there somebody's going to, a bicyclist is going to get hit on that road. I can guarantee it. I've almost seen three close calls already. High speeds. The street is too wide. It needs to either have a separated bike lane, uh, not even a rumble strip. I would put bullards. I would put something up along to protect that. I'm just saying, I've seen way too many vehicles cross over into the bike lane indiscriminately because they're going too fast and they don't pay attention. So on these other projects that we have, and as um, my other board member here mentioned about separated bike facilities, wherever it's possible, I would think we would, should look at any alternatives to create some sort of separation. Because um, I'm afraid that there is going to be something serious happening on some of these, these streets that we have especially when they're too wide. So I didn't know if design is going to be incorporated into some of this, because as we all know, I think when you narrow the roads, you have a tendency to slow down the speeds. The streets are wider. So <clears throat> I don't know if there's any comments to that. I do want to make one comment just about Clover Basin Drive. Um, there is a review that's coming just west of, well, an annexation, and then a development likely to to come out of that annexation just west of that location that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And with that, we're going to be doing some fairly significant improvements to that northern section of that road. And really, it's kind of two pieces right now. It's kind of almost a funny little rural section to the west, and we've improved that section to the east. So it does lend itself to having a little mix of suburban versus rural 
kind of nature to that roadway. So we are going to alleviate some of that, and I think Kyle has some more to add to that. So that one section with the new development proposal, um, we are looking at traffic safety through that straightaway area. So that's going to be um, part of our code. We do require some public improvements as well as uh, traffic calming measures of um, some kind that are acceptable for that type of roadway. Um, as well as you travel uh, west of Clover Basin, um, we've been talks with the district to improve our coordination on projects as we do repavings, chip ceilings, um, as well as just general safety improvements as we talk through Vision Zero. Um, so a lot of that's going to be coming with that program of seeing more things out on the road, more attention to bicyclists and pedestrians in the roadway, as well as uh, more protection at crossings. So um, working the district on a few items and a few standards to make sure we're on the same page and we kind of all accept the um, layout for around the school and how the school handles uh, releases as well. So that goes for the Altona, Eagle Crest, and then Silver Creek High School yeah, off so, Nelson Road. Right. Yep. So we've been in conversations with them about roadway safety along that road and then Grandview Meadows as well. So, yeah. Just Great. So you thank know. you. Yeah, Nelson yep. is awful when uh, on Silver Creek when school lets out. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, we're, we're having conversations about right now with the SRO and um, kind of future projects to I make the flow go. I don't think we could slow down those 16 and 17 year olds in their cars. That's <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the majority of the issues. Yeah. <laughs> Understood. Thank you. The first part of the presentation was about the uh, asphalt management program. <clears throat> and there was a reference to some possible um, restriping and reconfiguration of airport road just south of 17th and i'm wondering if the the existing double white lines are going to remain at that position and i also wonder what does a double white line mean in longmont <laughs> doesn't mean anything to a car <laughs> so uh, i believe the changes that are planned at that location are actually to eliminate what's now a dual southbound left uh, on Airport Road itself. So from 17th Avenue heading south, there's the two parallel southbound lanes with the double white between the two of them. And I think the original intent at the time when that was installed, and gosh, that was many years ago at this point, especially considering the faded nature of the striping that's out there right now, uh, the intent was to keep, I believe, those making right turns westbound or eastbound right turns that go south on Airport Road separate from those making the southbound uh, turn from westbound um, 17th Avenue. So you wouldn't have those two lanes merging together at that point. Um, but with the changes that are being implemented, those two lanes are going to be merged into one with that additional pavement actually being then repurposed into the bike facility that's there now. And I believe as it stands today, I don't think the northbound bike lane actually even makes its way all the way up to 17th Avenue. So the changes planned with repurposing that and eliminating that lane will allow for that northbound bike lane to extend all the way up to 17th Avenue. So sort of by answering, explaining that, the second question is the double white is just going to be going away um, and what it actually really means. It doesn't have any legal purpose at, at that point, but it's not like a double yellow, obviously. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this improvement wasn't part of your presentation, but it was uh, described in our packet, and it was also on the list of improvements that you presented at the end. Uh, Pace Street from 9th to 17th. Uh, what type of buffering is proposed for the new bike lanes there? So that project is in the early stages of design. Uh, I believe we're only just now selecting a design consultant to be able to start working on those improvements. So uh, the initial concept is to provide at a bare minimum our standard buffered bike lanes, which is the two foot buffer with a five foot lane. Uh, that would be accomplished by minor widening on the west side of Pace Street and the addition of a curb and gutter on that side as well. But as we work through design and potential alternatives, it may make sense to expand that to uh, either a larger buffer area. Uh, it just depends on the amount of 
space in which we have to work within as we come into both the intersections as 9th Avenue as well as at uh, Mountain View Avenue and proceeding up to 17th as well since that is actually capturing that whole stretch from 9th up to 17th so in Longmont when you say two foot buffer is that just paint it's two painted lines yes so okay. in, in terms of uh, referring to it as a buffer as opposed to a separated bike lane buffer would just be the paint separated would include some level of physical object in between the bike lane and travel lane got it thank you hello um i just want to make comments on two things so for the sunset um improvement you mentioned making it more ada compliant what are those features that make it ada compliant I think is that in reference to the first project we talked about with the re asphalt rehabilitation project? No, or? the sunset okay. and um, gotcha. Ken Pratt, okay. that one. <laughs> um, the improvements include um, two through lanes, one center turn lane, and dedicated bike lanes. Uh, the biggest thing is the alignments, the, the, the crossing will be aligned. Uh, in a, a better manner for pedestrians and people crossing the road. Mm -hmm. uh, there will also be ADA compliant ramps that get people on and off the street safer, mm -hmm. meet the uh, ADA requirements for slope and grade and things like that. Um, there's also some, some drainage improvements that are having to happen. So all of these things can happen at the intersection. Mm -hmm. And then Sunset Street, north of um, 119 is also getting this similar road diet to what happened from Kansas Avenue south out there mm -hmm. uh, where then that will carry through from that Kansas Avenue all the way up to Nelson is my understanding so mm -hmm. um, where sunset used to be a four-lane roadway it's going down to a two-lane roadway with a center lane and dedicated bike lanes on both sides mm -hmm. awesome that's great to hear because i know that intersection is crazy <laughs> one one other addition would be we would upgrade the, the traffic signals for any push buttons mm -hmm. um for to be in compliance with the uh, ada mm -hmm. so i just i'm wondering now like are there other inter other intersections and in long map that are not being ada compliant as well The answer to that would be yes. Mm -hmm. And are there like more plans so to address them as well? Part part of our asset management work is, um, and it's a it's a rule of of the Department of Justice is that whenever a community goes in to do any improvements, uh, whether it's a, a asphalt rehab or an intersection improvement, they are required um, to bring those intersections up to to ADA standards. Mm -hmm. um, and our Longman's been doing that for years. Mm -hmm. So any, whenever, as Alden indicated, whenever we're, we're doing uh, an asphalt rehab, we're also repairing and replacing concrete mm -hmm. and, and adjusting curb ramps. So the city, whenever we're doing a project, is, is bringing our, our intersections up to ADA mm -hmm. uh, standards. Awesome. That's great. Amazing to hear. I'm glad. <laughs> and then my other comment is not related really, but to the Dry Creek Greenway. I'm really happy to hear that development because I walk a lot around Longmont and it's gorgeous and that's like one of the best features around here. But my question is related to the fact that I live on the east side and across from Ken Pratt on the south. And I'm wondering what is the way or I guess how to phrase this between, you know, Costco and those new apartment developments there's the quail road and then there's like literally the saint vrain creek how would there be a way to connect the greenways there and people living on the east side to all these major new developments that are happening because in theory if i could walk out my door all the way to the mall that'd be crazy and amazing as well part of that most of that is in the planning realm so mm -hmm. What we'd really like you to do is work with us on the transportation mobility plan and make sure that those connections are included in that. Mm -hmm. And so then we can share those up 
and start to develop projects and start to get hopefully some grant funding or some kind of funding uh, to make those projects possible. We don't have a lot in that area, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. It was a plan to have the St. Vrain Greenway, and obviously that plan changed a little bit. Dan was is gone. Oh, he's still here. Good. Hi, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Dan's still here. Good. And he knows a lot about the changes of how the Greenway then went mm -hmm. south and didn't, didn't go next to the neighborhood that I think you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But we do have other ideas of how to get people across that roadway, hopefully more safe. We also have a Vision Zero plan that's coming on. You'll be hearing about that in the next um, month. I think we're going to bring that up in July. So mm -hmm. that would be a great place to also make that comment. So we'll mm -hmm. certainly take it into consideration mm -hmm. and move on to those next steps. So appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, no, no problem. Because I'll just walk from my apartment to uh, Zlane, Lane by Walmart and then into the uh, Sandstone Ranch, and then I wrap around Quicksilver, and then it's like I have to go north and then deal with the, the road on Ken Pratt or keep going, and I'm like, I don't feel like going like 20 more miles today. And we are trying to make it safer for you to go down East County Line Road mm -hmm. and be able to connect to the Greenway that way as well, so there's more direct connection hopefully that way. Yes, that'd be great. And I very much wholeheartedly support the Save Open Space as a person who benefits directly from it. It helps a lot. So thank you. That's all I had. Go me first. Or? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I just was hitting the buttons as I went. So. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, now with everyone else's questions, I came up with some more. So um, uh, 119 and Sunset, uh, you mentioned the realignment for pedestrian crossing do we have a distance of what that crossing will be like because i like currently i'm looking at google you know i do the measuring thing and it's about 146 feet to cross including the slip lane part if you're on the west side of sunset so i'm just curious in terms of safety obviously the less distance the better I can probably speak to that a little bit, and if anyone wants to add anything, feel free to do so. But uh, I know one of the challenges with that particular crossing is uh, absolutely agree that, yeah, the shorter distance is going to be better in the end in terms of less exposure time. I think by, by accomplishing that shorter distance, you would have to realign that pedestrian crossing such that it was farther away from the Sun Sunset Street intersection. So you're crossing rather than at a skew you're crossing it more at a perpendicular angle. And by doing so, at least on one leg of that uh, crossing, you're pulling uh, the section of the crosswalk away from the Sunset Street intersection, so farther away from the visibility of the corner, so that those vehicles that are gonna be making a turn on from, say, northbound Sunset to eastbound 119, uh, while you could shorten the crossing distance, you would be sort of tucking the pedestrian crossing farther away from the intersection and a vehicle could, could be making that turn uh, without seeing that there's somebody that's in the crosswalk potentially. So balancing shorter distance and visibility is something that I know that the project managers, manager has been trying to, to work through and consider as far as are we making it much shorter than is it, is it from what it is today? I believe it is with the addition of some of the or improvements at the islands but it still is a long crossing. I think any way you look at it due to the nature of it being a skewed intersection, it's going to be a long crossing without the addition of say a center island to mm -hmm. provide refuge. And then with it, like, you know, obviously it's complicated because of the skew. Uh, is that why we have to have the slip lanes essentially? It's just too sharp of a corner to get onto the Good question. Uh, I don't think I can fully answer that. Yeah, because right slip now. lanes are always an iffy, tricky part where a driver is not necessarily paying attention to people on on the crossing. So, well, with the other stakeholder in this area being a major moving company. Oh yeah. Um, we were just being cognizant of the, the trucks. Very large semi trucks. Yeah, yeah. yeah that have to use actually both sections because of the deliveries that come in as well so uh, i believe that was part of the issue was just trying to accommodate um probably the largest truck that our roads carry hmm. and then uh my, my final comment is i just like to second um old chair laner and and board member burrows just because 
you know, I, uh, uh, in terms of buffered bike lanes, I would be curious. I'm sure there's a study out there that I'll find uh, that will talk about, you know, how effective is paint um, when when we know if we widen a road, vehicles go faster. So, does paint solve that problem, or are we just creating faster cars? So, just something to keep in mind for all our future projects. Thank you. Great. And uh, thank you, Chair Laner, for allowing me to gather my thoughts. I um, yeah, overall, I I love um, the hearing the updates on these projects. Very excited for Spring Gulch too. That'll help uh, my commute as a someone that bikes to work. Um, I also am someone who bikes to work and does bike on County Line Road where it is. And um, I uh, also share the concerns that Chair Laner and um, Chair and uh, Board Member McKee Burroughs has on the. Um, the side streets and I am concerned about the uh, connection from 17th Avenue to um, to Highway 66. Um, I don't see the why it would be necessary to get a shoulder when um, I think it, instead we should be encouraging pedestrians and bicyclists to use Sundance Drive. Um, from what I can see, they can easily access Sundance Drive to 17th to get onto County Line Road as it stands. Um, and that uh, adding a shoulder creates a uh, false sense of safety. But um, that's just my concern. Um, Cause as, as it is right now, I, I go from 9th Street to, um, to and County Line Road to um, Highway 119, and I do not feel safe on the shoulder personally. I end up using the sidewalk whenever possible. I would just maybe make one comment to that. P pardon me. Is I don't know if you saw the picture that was associated with that presentation slide where the person was walking on no shoulder. And so people are out there bicycling and walking that today and they're not they know about Sundance and they're not using it so we that was part of the consideration and then also just the general safety to all traffic like all users of the roadway being able to provide that shoulder actually gives a little leeway I mean right now if you look at the cross section it is just the white line and then it falls right into gravel and dirt and some grass I guess but um, so this allows a little bit more latitude uh, when somebody is not paying attention or things like that. So we're hoping that it really affects all drivers. So I'll just leave it with that. All right. Um, just want to say thank you for the update on everything. Thank you for the comments from the board. Um, yeah, I think for me personally, I think that there needs to be a shoulder over there. Just listen at the comment. I understand. Um, you know, I understand the opposite, but I feel like it needs to be a shoulder just even for drivers to have somewhere to pull over in the middle. I mean, it's dark on 66 and if something happens and just for public safety um, reasons, it's, it's important to have a shoulder on on that road. Um, but um, because people do not follow rules, we know that, right? And so if we can, thinking about Vision Zero, thinking about how we can lessen um, fatalities or accidents. I think having a shoulder on a major highway or like that um, is very important. Um, I just wanted to comment, really I wanted to comment on, on <laughs> Sunset. I live right there on Kansas and Sunset. And so I walk Kim Pratt all the time and um, that light, crossing that light, going um, west on um, Kim Pratt 119 is um, the where you push the button to cross. I'm trying to be a good pedestrian. So I push the button and so wait for my little, the, um, the little white man on the screen to tell me to go. Um, but you know you don't have enough time i'm glad we're changing the the lights because it's not enough time 
oftentimes to cross, at least for me going west, it is, but for those who are going north and south because it's so wide of a road, it's not enough time. I've seen so many people almost get hit, whether they were on the bike or pedestrians walking over to the bus stop. Um, and the light in general, just to make a a, a left-hand turn to go, well, to go any turn, the lights are so short um, and there's no turning lane. And so I have seen so many <laughs> almost accidents almost every day um, and we know there's a high school right there we know that front range college kids are right students are over there we know there's a middle school parents um, in the afternoon or early mornings it's crazy and let alone talking about Johnson moving company that's right there as well and so you have teenagers driving you have parents who's dropping off and parents who picking up and um, all right there at that corner really and so people who are on Kansas it's really difficult for them to get out to go north on sunset um, and so I know what I've done many a times is turn around on Kansas and go the long way just so I can get out of that so it's very very challenging for that the residential community over in that area and like I said I walk all the time so <sighs> Yeah, I don't know how you would tighten it up because I feel like the uh, when you want to cross and you push the button and you have to walk to that corner, it is sometimes cars are not paying attention. Yeah, you know that. But and I know it's a pedestrian's responsibility to also pay attention uh, to the vehicles. But when the light is very short, you are basically running across the street just so you can cross it. So um I think one of the things is making the lights longer for sure and I'm glad we are narrowing the road and we do need a turning signal and the lights need to be longer and where you push that button to cross over on the east side of the street it is far from that corner so if you don't have that much time to cross and you already pushed the button and you have to walk another I don't even know how many feet it is from where you push to get you know, the option to cross over for the little white man to tell you to go. It's not a woman. I don't know what it is. It's a white sy symbol. Um, I'm, my friend who lives in London showed me they just have the female and male sign on the lights over there. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, we need to do something more inclusive about that. Just saying, um, <laughs> since we're talking about the lights. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of issues. I'm so glad we're working on that. But there are a lot of issues on Sunset and um, Kim Pratt right there. Not just that light, but the street that you all have already paved over there. Like I said, you have a middle school, you got a high school, and that traffic gets so backed up. And then you have these big 18-wheelers just sitting on the side where you can't view and see where you're going sometimes. They have the trailers on Kansas, and you can't see. So just being in consideration of all those factors and variables that's over there. Yep, and all the points you brought up. Um, we're hoping to have a presentation on our new traffic signal project, hopefully maybe in August for, you, for a lot of time. Um, but part of that project will be to have uh, turn ind indicators and dedicated turning movements for left turners um, for that area, as well as if you notice on best sample is a uh, third in Kimbark or fourth in Maine, um, we are starting to add dedicated uh, leading ped pedestrian intervals. Um, so if fourth Avenue is the one I probably walk the most since it's right by our office. Um, I believe that one's about six seconds of leading interval time. So usually mm -hmm. it's people about halfway across the road before uh, the lights turn green for opposing traffic. Um, so I encourage you guys, if you haven't tested it out, that's kind of what we're piloting right now. That's be part of that new system. Um, as well as with the, um, I know we talked about the, the slip lanes a little bit, um, but the part of that is to reduce that time between crossings. Um, does leave a little bit vulnerable, but uh, what we're trying to do additionally is with our new detection, uh, provide a little more variability for different types of pedestrians that we might see in the roadway. Um, but I will have some more in-depth information and some infographics for you guys, uh, hopefully the next couple months. So happy to ask some more questions about that later. Great, thank you, thank you. And trains come through there blowing their horns 
all the time, all the time. So I'm happy about Mm -hmm. all of what you all were talking about. And that should be part of the quiet zone. Right. I know. No no, no more train tooting. I love it. Thank you. Yep. Um, Just following up on that comment about the um, delayed pedestrian crossing, since you mentioned it. um, LPI, leading leading pedestrian. Yes, there you go. Um, When you're figuring out that timing of when you start traffic being able to flow, Mm -hmm. do you take into account how long it takes for a pedestrian to get halfway across? Because on some of those leading LIP, is that right? LPI. (laughs) LPI. Mm-hmm. Um, they're pretty. The the way you press the button and going to the actual corner is pretty far away. Yep. And so, even for me, I it's already the the timing is already going down before I even get to the crossing. Mm-hmm. So, do you take that into account when you're figuring out those timings? That's my question. Yeah. So for the leading present the leading present yeah the leading pedestrian interval. Um, one of the requirements is that the Brett needs to be pushed before the cycle starts. If it starts after, we do have a program that's called a reservice, where it'll give you the Walkman again and the countdown. But since the light's already green, um, it won't go back to red because that causes a lot of confusion. Um, so you kind of lose that protection. So you won't get the leading interval until the next cycle, but you can get the reservice so you can be able to cross the road. Okay. Cause, um, yeah, because th- some of them are pretty far away. Yeah, and process. as we're doing these upgrades, um, there are some ADA compliance um, upgrades we've been doing most recently. If you ever want to go over to 11th of Main or 19th of Main, we just, when I say we, CDOT, uh, we just provide some consulting. Um, Update that area with, um, they're still working on it. We're going to put some concrete in, uh, installed new pedestrian push buttons, um, and those are closer to the curb ramps and returns, as well as some have been directionalized um, to allow those movements. And as we uh, switch of our new system in the coming weeks. Um, we'll be introducing more of those leading intervals for traffic just to um, get people in the road and let people know they're crossing and out, before, especially for those left turners. Okay, thank you. I just, mm. I, went, I went through one today, so that's why I'm yep. asking the question because third in Kimbark, it, the, turn, the button is miles away from the corner. Like it's, it's a good five feet. Yeah, and it's and a pain. And we're, as we're trying to upgrade these, um, there are some stipulations. It's uh, right now it's ten feet from the uh, flow line of the curb um, for the push button needs to be. So we're trying to, our best to adhere to those uh, standards as much as we can, barring utility issues or right of way issues. Um, but we're also exploring more into um, more passive measures as well for uh, pedestrian detection. Okay, thank you. Yep. I, I just had another question. I'm sorry. Oh no, you're fine. Um, it's about the ADA compliance. Um, I'm not 100% familiar with the ADA compliance on the curb cuts and how you do those at the corners, but uh, almost every intersection, the curb cut is a diagonal to where you cross. So you, you either go, if you're going like north south or east west, it's always between the two streets. And mm. so it's never really a good angle for either direction because you're always going, basically, you're going straight into traffic because it's a diagonal. And I'm thinking, like, if it, someone who's in a wheelchair is going to be literally riding right into traffic because they're going at a diagonal rather than going with the flow. Does that make sense? Yep, yep. And we do have a lot of those uh, um, curb cut sections in the city. Um, we have been, as we've had uh, projects, trying to directionalize those as much as possible. Um, the reason for the um, kind of dome ones that go kind of diagonally is most likely for spacing. It was an older standard. Uh, the newer standards um, would like to edge towards more directional ramps um, where we can fit them. Um, but there are certain instances where um, we can't have the correct spacing and um, turn space for directionalized ramps. So um, if there are some interesting looking ramps, that would be the reason why. But we strive our mo- best to install directionalized. Okay. Yeah, I'm just thinking about the one you just redid on Pike and Hover because it goes like basically it's all the way around now. Where you have the um, curve coming down, so it's it doesn't matter which direction you come from because it just goes all the way around, and it's not just like one tiny little strip. I've never checked that off the top of my head. I can't quite picture it, yeah. but uh, we'll check it out and see. Uh, sometimes uh, it does happen with uh, kind of the turn radius of 
just the entire intersection and how much, again, right away we might have. Um, as I know, I think it's Oscar Blues on that corner. Um, I think we're right against the right away, I believe. Yeah, I'm thinking about the east side. You just, east you side. just redid that side. Uh, well, it, yeah, that's east we'll, side. we'll look, definitely look into it yeah. and see. Because I, um, really like, I really like the way you did yep. it because it's very easy to enter from any, either direction. You're not dealing with it going into a diagonal traffic. So anyway, I just wanted to mm -hmm. ask that question. Thank yeah, you. No problem. Okay, Phil, do we have any um, action items? We have no action items tonight. So thanks to our staff for coming and presenting. Appreciate that. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. Yeah. Okay, um, we'll do comments from the board members, and I'll switch it up again. We'll start with uh, Council Member Yarborough, and we'll go this way. How's that? <laughs> oh. But I got to do that. So there you go. Thank you. Um, I really don't have anything to say. I think I talked a lot already. So I will say that I won't be here next month. I'll be in Japan. So sorry I'll miss that because I really want to hear about Vision Zero, the update, and everything about that. What What you gonna tell me? It's on YouTube. Okay. It'll be saved for you. So we'll get. <laughs> make I sure you get it. Okay. Yeah. I'll watch yeah. it when I come back. Okay. Absolutely. Have fun. <laughs> have yes. A good trip. Yes. Thank you. Um, I also do not have any further comments. Appreciate all the information tonight. I want to thank staff for the presentation. Very informative, and it's great to hear and see. Uh, so many projects ongoing in Longmont with multimodal components. Um, just two questions and comments. Um, so from our open forum uh, public hearing, um, mentioned about the open space and asking us to put a nomination to City Council. I don't know if that is a possibility or if that is a we're process. Gonna, we're going to do that in a, in a bit here. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, my other question or, I guess, comment is um, in conversations that um, Taylor and I and Phil had, uh, we talked about maybe having a discussion about um, the board coming together and kind of talking about what we want to see moving forward in July when we have the new board members. And I was just wondering if that's going to be happening or not. Well, we should talk more about that, but... We will have our business meeting in July, but that'll just kind of be the first, that'll just be the introduction, right, for for any new members. So um, we'll have to do that first, and then we can talk about if you want to bring that up, maybe as the same thing that we're going to try to do in item number 10 here for the open space piece is bring that up as um, something specific in the agenda for future. Thank you. Well, I don't really have any comments, so th thank you for the presentation. Uh, thanks for answering all our questions. I hope it was entertaining for you all. So um, it's always informative for me as well. So thank, thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, I wanted to thank staff again for um, the insights. And um, yeah, I look forward to um, really conceptualizing what it looks like to um, honor Vision Zero with uh, with these um, sides, uh, these bike ways. Um, so very thought-provoking things that I'll be taking with me. Um, also, I just happened to find this piece of art from uh, Caitlin Zesmer that is a local Colorado artist, and it just made me uh, smile. So I just wanted to show it to everyone. <laughs> Um, and supporting Colorado local artists. Um, and uh, yes, also I wanted to thank uh, Dan and the Friends of Open Space for um, really keeping um, the TAB in mind on um, something that they are very passionate about. And uh, is it appropriate to make a recommendation as an action item or do we wait? Okay. We, we will wait, we'll wait in the next step. So I uh, just wanna say thank you.
Okay. Um, again, thank you, staff, uh, for the presentation and all the information. And I would second what uh, Board Member McInerney said in terms of it's nice to see that we're looking at things that are multimodal now uh, in regards to these projects. And so to address the SOS, because it's been brought up now three times, um, what uh, I've been advised is um, city can't really be involved in this, but um, as a board, we could vote today to recommend um, to the city council that we, they adopt um, what SOS is asking for. So we could bring that to a vote tonight if we would like. If there's any discussion points, we're open to have a discussion about it as well. So what I'll do right off the bat is, are, are there any concerns or discussions to be had about this? I'm sorry, Phil. Yep. Just a point of order. order. I just want to make sure, if you'd like to act on this item, we'll have to add it to, an, you'll have to add it to an agenda. So we need a motion and a second to add it to next month's agenda. And then we could add it as an action item to next month's agenda in which it'll get posted. Everybody will be able to see what the action item is. And then you can take action on it next month, just to be clear. Thank you. Uh, motion to add the adoption or recommendation to city council of the SOS to next month's meeting. <laughs> Second. All those in well, favor? Can, can I make one comment for discussion purposes? Sure. Uh, are we allowed to ask uh, Dan Wolford any questions about this right now or no? I'll take that as a no. <laughs> My thought is it's more appropriate next month, but. Okay. All right. Thank you. Unless it's about this moving it to next month. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So are there other items for next month's agenda is that business meeting we talked about having as our first meeting as a new board. So we'll have a, it'll be a new makeup next month. Uh, it is going to be July 15th and not on the typical meeting date that we have in uh, uh, so that'll help us with the holiday piece, get away, get us a little further away from the holiday so that people can make that meeting. We did poll the group, and I think we found that most everybody could make that July 15th meeting except for one person. Apologies. Uh, we'll also talk about Vision Zero, and we'll have a, uh, some more information about the transportation mobility plan at that meeting. Um, we probably will have some updates as well for microtransit. So we'll get everything in front of you next month. Thank you very much. Great. Um, I think with that, we can wrap it up. I guess I need a, a motion to end the meeting. A motion to adjourn the Transportation Advisory Board meeting. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 aye.